I've been to a lot of crime scenes, but I've never seen one like this. The brutalness of it. A murder of excessive cruelty. What she must have gone through. You stabbed the girl twice in the neck, and those are the fatal wounds. Why are you poking at her 54 more times? Was this a sexual homicide? Absolutely. The victim of an obsessive killer. I could see where a female of her size could have killed her. You began to think that there's something wrong with this guy and that he could be your killer. It was just weird. It was just strange. He was also He'll be revealed. He who solves the crime is the person that looks, relooks, and looks again. It never ends until you find your, your killer. Every day in North America, dozens of people are murdered. The key to solving the toughest of these homicides lies in the final 24 hours of the victim's life. To crack the case, detectives must reconstruct that critical timeline. The minutes and hours containing evidence that can help unlock the mystery and catch the killer. Coast sits the quiet community of Jacksonville Beach enjoyed by many for its surf, sand, and sunshine. Jacksonville Beach is um, kind of a bedroom community for Jacksonville. We have a huge mix of both young people and your older folks that are retired. It's not real touristy like other parts of Florida, which is actually fine with the people that live here. We're a small community here in Jacksonville Beach. So we don't have the really serious crime. I mean, you have your auto burglaries, you have your, your occasional house run with that stuff. It's the Thanksgiving holiday, and Jacksonville Beach residents are gathering with their families. But that sense of celebration and security is about to be shattered. Dave Jacksonville Beach woman, Corey Parker, was due to go to work at the restaurant that she worked at in Atlantic Beach on Friday. And when she didn't show up that morning, the manager said, well, there's got to be something wrong. So she sent the cook to check on her. When he got there around 11, she didn't answer. And when he did, he saw a bloody uh, body part. I got the call from our dispatch with the patrol working an act of suicide. So I told my wife, my two kids, I'd be back hopefully shortly. So I proceeded to Corey Parker's apartment. I've been to a lot of crime scenes, but I've never seen one like this the brutalness of it and what she must have gone through with all of the stab wounds from the navel up to her throat and even the ones on her face. Absolutely. William Carlisle and Eddie Bounds are assigned to the case. Corey was covered in blood. There was an extreme amount of blood on the bed. The bed sheets were in disarray. The victim is Corey Parker a 25-year-old college student, originally from Rochester, New York. Corey could just light up the room. Her smile was as big as the day. I call her a social butterfly. Um, she was very, you know, open, very outgoing, so it was easy for her to make friends. I always feel like if I... Corey Parker left her home to come here to Florida from New York. She was a college student working two jobs. By all accounts, her physical appearance, her, her demeanor, her personality um, was easy to like. She was just full of energy and vim and vitality and just a really nice person. And, you know, so it makes you wonder, you know, who, who, who would be so enraged that they would want to, to take her life? To find Corey Parker's killer, Detectives must piece together the last 24 hours of her life, starting with the crime scene. She had defensive marks uh, 
wounds on her arms and hands. She had two severe wounds to her throat um, that were the, uh, were the fatal wounds. There were also 54 stab wounds to her chest and abdomen that were uh, post-mortem uh, after she died. You stabbed the girl twice in the neck, and those are the fatal wounds. Why are you poking at her 54 more times after she's dead? It's indicative of overkill. There's two schools of thought on this. Number one, this is extreme rage. Someone knew the victim uh, and, I mean, just keeps stabbing because they hate them that much. On the flip side, there's research my colleagues and I have carried out to confirm that more than 15 stab wounds involving a female is inherently sexual. There is a disorder called picarism, which is sexual gratification obtained as disturbing as this sounds from repeatedly penetrating a human body with some type of stabbing instrument. She was obviously posed on the bed and her legs were spread. For her to be put in that position and to be laid. There was a pair of panties. They appeared to have been taken off of her, so it did look like she was wearing those when she went to bed. The evidence technician examined those panties and they were able to locate a Caucasian head hair, which had a root bulb on the end of it. Finding hair at a crime scene in itself is not significant unless you have that rich source of DNA, which is in the root of the hair. Without that, hairs can be substantively similar, but it cannot be conclusively linked to a single offender. Corey's killer. There were finger marks on the uh, windowsill, and uh, it appeared that someone had put their hand there to uh, lower himself out of the window after killing Corey. But there was no sign of any ridge detail, um, fingerprints, so to speak. So you can assume from that that the suspect was wearing gloves. They came prepared because they knew that they were trying to avoid being detected. Corey's body was found at 11 a.m. on Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. But to narrow down her, they start with her friend and neighbor, Ashley. The last time I saw Corey was the night before Thanksgiving. She was talking about meeting her friends for Thanksgiving. Um, and taking over some pies that she was going to bake. So she started baking her pies. We had a beer. Ashley was able to tell us that around 5 or 6 o'clock that she and Corey were interacting together back and forth in the, in the apartment. After all of that, she was getting ready to go out that night, and... Um, Corey had baked the pies so she could attend an orphan's Thanksgiving for people that did not have um, family in town. She didn't show up for that party, so her friends thought that maybe she got a better offer and decided not to come. Time of death is very hard to, to pinpoint. Uh, they can do it on TV. They can tell you it's uh, the person died at 11 o'clock, but in reality, you really can't do that. So that party helped us fill that immediate timeline prior to her death. Detective spoke to Ashley and 6 p.m. on Thursday when she didn't show up for her friend's Thanksgiving dinner. Detectives now canvass the neighborhood to see if anyone noticed anything suspicious during that time. We asked, do you remember who might have been in the neighborhood scene walking around or suspicious cars, things like that. Many people are away for Thanksgiving, but there are a few around, among them a 17-year-old neighbor. We spoke to this guy, Robert. He was just another person that lived in the area near Corey. He said nothing out of the ordinary, and apparently was sleeping, he thought and didn't know what she looked like, didn't know where she lived at other than we were seeing the police tape around her apartment 
He said, that's where I figured she lived at because that was all the police activity. The canvas seems to be hitting a dead end until police speak to another neighbor. He said he'd seen somebody in the back, which would have been the east portion of Corey's apartment. There was an alleyway that leads to a set of convenience stores. And it was that area that he said he saw a guy looking in her back bedroom window. When we use the term peeping Tom, we usually refer to somebody who's spying on people. They're engaging in this sort of behavior because it's sexually arousing for them. The majority of people who conduct these hands-off sex offenses don't escalate into hands-on offenders, but it can happen. They can become people who would rape or otherwise engage in a violent sexual assault. Could the actions of a peeping Tom have escalated into the violent murder of Corey Parker? We started, you know, really hitting that hard, set up surveillance teams um, in case he came back. And it's common for people to come back to a crime scene and relive that moment. So we sat at many... Detectives Carlisle and Bounds have honed in on their first lead in Corey Parker's murder. A peeping Tom, recently spotted in her apartment complex. We were in surveillance mode at that point, looking for any valuable information, but we really didn't have anything uh, specific to go on. With the peeping Tom lead going nowhere, detectives shift the focus of their investigation. Rule of thumb in homicide investigation is to talk to an intimate partner, current or former boyfriend, any strains or stresses on the relationship, financial, romantic. Corey had recently started dating David Tippins just three weeks before her murder. I remember meeting David one time when he came to pick her up. She really liked him and thought that maybe she could have more feelings for him and that she could possibly be falling in love with him. Police called David down to the station for questioning. Investigators got the sense that David was um, pretty shaken by Corey's murder. He was very upset. But during the previous weeks uh, before she was uh, murdered, Corey had spent the night at David's place on Monday night before Thanksgiving and then took him to the airport the next morning. He had gone to Pensacola for the Thanksgiving weekend to be with his family. We obviously wanted to verify that, and he was able to provide us with plane tickets, both going and coming, that indicated that he was out of town and was, in fact, not here uh, during the time that Corey was murdered. The detectives know from talking to David that he was unable to reach Corey on Thanksgiving Day. Turn machine, checked everything in there. So he was, uh, in our opinion, was telling us the truth. So I think there was a reasonable suspicion that she was dead by then on Thanksgiving morning. Having established that David had no opportunity to murder Corey, he's eliminated as a suspect. Detectives are now pursuing a new theory that Corey was murdered after 6 p.m. on Wednesday and before David's call around 11 a.m. on Thanksgiving Thursday. They now focus their attention on the timeline, specifically Wednesday night, when Corey... ...contact with Corey on um, Wednesday night. And one of the people that said, hey, you know, Corey was my friend and I was with her on Wednesday night was Tiffany. Seeming desperate to help the investigation, Corey's friend Tiffany Zienta volunteers to come down to the station. Tiffany described her relationship with Corey as, as one of um, very, very close, really good friends. She said a couple of times that she loved Corey. Tiffany said they were at the Ritz Bar. The Ritz Bar is a very well-known hangout of young, if you're somebody. That night, there was Corey, Tiffany, and there was at least three or four of them were girlfriends. 
Tiffany explains that she was with Corey all evening at the Ritz bar until they left at 1.30 a.m. in their separate cars. But there's more. One of the things Tiffany tells police about that night was that um, Corey had gotten into a bit of an altercation with a mutual acquaintance named Gregory at the Ritz bar that night. Tiffany made it sound like it was something significant with Gregory. And so we wanted to know what he had to say about that. Oh, Corey that well, and that, you know, nothing out of the ordinary happened. He bumped into her or something, and she turned around and looked at him, and it was just, it was just really nothing, uh, according to him. When police talked to Corey's other friends that were at the Ritz that night, they validated Gregory's story. As far as we knew, there was nothing to indicate that Greg had a problem with Corey. But Tiffany made it sound more like it was something significant. So it appeared that she was actually lying about it. And our how close she and Corey were, um, that they were not as close as she described. I got the sense that she wanted that relationship to be more than Corey sounded like from her friends. Tiffany was was one that, and I, not to use the word alpha, but it was a very front confronting person. Corey's friends believe Tiffany may have had a sexual interest in Corey, you know, and that kind of got the attention of police because here you had a crime scene where the victim was posed sexually but there was no evidence of a rape. Whether or not um, there could have been some one-sided love interest on the part of Tiffany, and that, that maybe she killed Corey as some sort of a jilted lover, or you know maybe she was upset that Corey had found this new boyfriend uh, and was dating him and, and had pushed her out. Having established a motive, detectives theorize that when Tiffany and Corey left the bar together at 1.30 a.m., albeit in their own cars, Tiffany had the opportunity to follow Corey home and murder her. That she really, in our opinion, should not have had. We learned that she knew details of what happened to Corey. And where did she get that information from? How does she know what happened to Corey if she wasn't there herself? Can she be the killer? Tiffany's a big person, much in stature, much bigger than Corey. And I'm thinking it would have taken somebody much bigger to overpower Corey and to have controlled her in that confined area in the bedroom. So when Tiffany came into the picture, I could see where a female of her size could have been the one that killed Corey Parker. We're closing in on a prime suspect in Corey Parker's murder. Her friend, Tiffany. Tiffany's interest in Corey seemed to be a little over the top uh, from, from your normal friendship, so we definitely wanted to look at that. And that's what investigators are focusing on. They zero in on the end of the evening at 1.30 a.m. on November 26th, when Tiffany says she and Corey left the Ritz bar in their separate cars. Tiffany, Corey, and other group of friends left the Ritz going home. Well, Tiffany stated that she was taking a friend home in Ponte Vedra. Corey went to her residence. Tiffany would later tell her friend she called Corey on her cell phone saying, if it got late, coming from Ponte Vedra, and I changed my mind. I'm not going to make it. I'm just going to go to bed. I'll see you tomorrow. We pulled Corey's phone records. And there was no record of Tiffany's call on Corey's um, phone records. Detectives confront Tiffany with this information. She said, I was very intoxicated. And she said, I was speed dialing all of my friends. And she said, I thought I talked to Corey, but maybe I was talking to someone else. And then she told me that she went by the apartment. Um, it was late. It was about 4 in the morning. And that um, they were home. 
We strongly feel that based on the condition of the body when it was found on Friday and the circumstances of her death, we believe that she was most likely killed in the hours following her immediate return to her house on early Thursday morning. Detectives believe Tiffany had the opportunity to kill Corey and dig deeper into her alibi. She said she took a friend home to Ponte Vedra. But other than that, nobody saw her come home that night. Nobody confirmed that they heard her come in. So Tiffany didn't have an airtight alibi. Tiffany's lack of a bone. Corey inside the apartment, and Corey put up a struggle. And Tiffany didn't want that to come out, that she was gay or that she had wanted a relation more than Corey did. And so Tiffany killed Corey Parker. Tiffany had the opportunity and a possible motive but they need to place her in Corey's apartment at the time of the murder. If they can connect her DNA to the hair found in Corey's underwear, then they can prove she's the killer. The problem was we couldn't talk to her because she had lawyered up, so we couldn't get samples of her DNA. So we had to secure a uh, search warrant. When DNA is subpoenaed, by the this is usually done after other attempts have been made to obtain that DNA. Because as soon as you serve them with that subpoena, they know right away now that they are in play as a potential suspect. And you hope that they comply with the order, but they can also uh, jump on a plane. We went to serve a search warrant, and she had moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She picked up all of her belongings and moved them, and a real quick, hastily move, which to me, drew more attention to her. A lot of, what with me, red flags are flying. We had to actually fly to Louisiana and interview her in Baton Rouge. Oh, you're gonna do that. But when the results come back from the lab, Tiffany's DNA isn't a match, and she is eliminated as a suspect. We really believe that she was a suspect because she knew details of the crime scene. Well, we learned that she was a bartender at a local restaurant, and the firefighters that responded to the scene had been in the restaurant and had been telling her what they observed there because she, they knew she knew Corey. Tiffany's behavior is really hard to explain. As murder investigations go, she acted the part. Oh, uh, Tiffany wanted attention. Or maybe she actually did want to help solve the case. But there's a very strong theme of fantasy here. And maybe that was just to have a more in-depth relationship than what's actually the case. Determined to find Corey's killer, detectives expand the scope of their investigation to the restaurant where she worked. Eric Eli was an employee that was infatuated with Corey. She would make complaints about this guy. There was a back area that they go to smoke at in the restaurant. Well, other employees would say that when Corey was out, Corey being Corey would, would try to let him down gently and be nice to him. But from all accounts, I mean, she had no interest in dating him. And um, he couldn't really take no for an answer. Corey told Eric that she did not date co-workers. And Eric's response to that was, well, I'll quit my job. That sort of piques your curiosity. So yes, we were interested in Eric at that point. With Eric Eli now in their crosshairs, detectives bring him down to the station for questioning. There's a couple things that get the detectives' attention. The most noticeable are these someone had scratched or clawed at him. He explained those away or attempted to. It's just part of his job. Eric basically denied killing Corey, and then he eerily gave details that were similar to what actually occurred in the crime scene. He made some statements that, yeah, if I would have done it, I didn't do it now, but if I would have done it, I would have cut her throat, I would have raped her. Eric talked about how he would have stabbed her multiple times. He would have left the body in the condition that it was. And it was it was actually very disturbing. To me, in a normal state of mind, would not come in and, and give us that kind of detail. 
And so, yeah, you're beginning to think that there's something wrong with this guy and that, that he could be your killer. Detectives are zeroing in on Corey Parker's co-worker, Eric Eli, as her killer. In theorize, he was motivated by rejection. Eric, to me, stands out as right away a very uh, viable suspect. I mean, here is someone who has been uh, rejected by the victim. Here is someone who places great erotic value on typically don't stay fantasies and that they could be actually taking the step to commit murder. But detectives need to prove Eric had the opportunity to kill Corey and look into his alibi. He told us on Thanksgiving Day, he made her a Thanksgiving dinner and then called her to invite her over. Of course, she didn't answer the phone, um, but, you know, just that he would go to that length was just weird, it was just strange. But is he off his rocker or, or did he actually do it? That could have been him throwing them off the trail, creating an alibi for himself. If his head hairs, her pubic hairs are on the sheets or on her body, is his hair the, the forcibly removed head hair in the panties? Eric agrees to give a DNA sample, but when the results come in, they turn the entire investigation on its head. There was no match on any of it. I mean, there's no physical evidence matched to him, no fingerprints in the apartment, none of his hairs were on her bed, none of his hairs were in her panties. So, you know, you can't put him there. And then you can't, you can't say that he killed her just based on his crazy statements. So I wrote him off as far as see these things go unsolved. And so you dig and you keep on because he who solves the crime is the person that looks, relooks, and relooks. And you just keep digging. And it never ends until you find your, your killer. Detectives are under enormous pressure to solve Corey's murder and put Jacksonville Beach at ease. There was a lot of fear in the community. I knew a lot of women that lived alone, and a lot of them got really fearful after this happened. We were definitely afraid. You know, the whole town was just on pins and needles, just crazy. Corey Parker's case has gone cold, and now the Parker family is offering a $20,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. Wanted posters went up around the beach with Corey's picture and the reward amount and the number to call. The reward campaign net some responses, and as news tips roll in, one in particular catches the detective's attention. These four individuals, and they were all workers at a barbecue restaurant in Jacksonville Beach, and they started talking about the case. One of the tips was from a co-worker of Robert Denny. But around the time of the murder, that, that Robert Denny was acting a little strange. When the detectives looked up Robert Denny in their database, they discovered he was one of the neighbors that they talked to right after the murder. He told them he didn't see anything, didn't know anything, and nothing about him at that time raised any red flags. He was a 17-year-old kid living at the beach with his sister. We were able to find out from the sister that he was um, bringing pornography into the house. He had some nocturnal habits that she wasn't real pleased with. The uh, residents at night smoking a cigarette and would actually try to peep in her windows. And so she kicked him out. She gave the detectives information about Robert Denny's brother, who, as it so happened, was in prison in Texas for stabbing a woman 86 times. And that was eerily similar to what had happened to Corey. And you start thinking, well, is Robert trying to outdo his brother? It makes you wonder, what's the role of nature and nurture here? Could the same factors be at play for Robert as with his brother? That being said, he was living at the time of Corey's murder, but he's long gone. We were able to take a look around and, and see 
that both from inside and outside that Robert had a uh, full view of Corey's apartment. So he was able to look out his uh, bedroom window and, and see Corey coming or going. If she had her blinds open, he could see right into her kitchen and living room area. We talked to the manager of the barbecue restaurant and also another coworker. And they told us that they had both been over to his apartment on separate occasions, and he had referenced the girl downstairs, Corey. Arrows pointing in Robert Denny's direction at that point. But the detectives still didn't have really anything tying him to this crime. There was no, no direct evidence that Robert Denny had anything to do with this. With Robert Denny now the prime suspect in Corey Parker's murder, Detectives scour his background and learn he's now living in Easton, Maryland. He had met this 52-year-old woman online in a chat room type situation, and she had told him via email she represented herself to him as a 25-year-old girl. He represented himself to her as a twin January, freezing cold. She opens the door one night to a knock on the door, and there he's standing in a pair of jean shorts and a T-shirt. So she lets him in. Well, come to find out, she let him move in. We contacted the uh, Easton police. And so we come up with this story that the police chief's son up there in Easton was injured as a result of a fight and that Robert matched the general uh, description of the suspect in that case and asked him for a sample of his DNA. With their plan in motion, detectives get Robert Denny to come. The case. And he said, you know, I don't decline, but I'd like to talk to my attorney first. So we gave him a bottle of water, see if he'll drink from that. If he does, we get his saliva, and we get his DNA that way. He looked at the bottle of water. He took it in his hand, but he never drank from it. And then we took him for a break out in the garage to have him smoke the cigarettes. And when he was done smoking the cigarette, we were hoping that he'd drop the cigarette in the ashtray and we could go get it. But he took the butt and put it behind his ear. He wouldn't put it out in the ashtray. So, you know, who does that? Nobody. Detectives take a different tack. We had generated these forms saying, hey, I, Robert Denny, have been asked for my DNA sample. I declined to give this sample. And then we were going to get him to sign it, date it, and then put it in an envelope and lick it and seal it. And then we'd have his DNA on the envelope. So then we did the forms, asked him to sign that. Well, he looked at it, read it. And then he put down there, I don't decline. I would just like to speak to my attorney. So we asked him, OK, well, how about sealing that in the envelope. He told us, nice try. I know what you're trying to do. You're not going to get my DNA. So he, I mean, he was almost out. And so we knew, we knew he was savvy. And I was even more convinced at that point that he was our guy because, you know, he's avoiding every effort to get his DNA sample. But, you know, I was committed to solving this case. And I wasn't leaving Eastern Maryland until I got a, um, a sample of his DNA. After a number of dead ends in their investigation, detectives are closing in on Corey Parker's killer, but they need physical evidence to prove their case. Business. He worked at a computer store there in downtown Easton. And um, we were able to watch him as he would come out you know, about every 40, 45 minutes, smoke a cigarette. We were waiting for the instance where if he would leave the cigarette, they would extract the DNA from the cigarette. We never did. He would break the filters off and put the filter in the pocket, throw the tobacco down to the ground. But unbeknownst to us, he had a uncontrollable spitting habit where he would arbitrarily just spit on the ground. And um, we kind of noted where the spit went in the parking lot. So he then turns around and walks into the computer store and then seven different areas. Let those dry, packaged them up, drove them over to the FBI lab in DC. Two weeks later, the FBI DNA analyst called me 
and said that he had identified Robert Denny's DNA from the spit to the hair in Corey's panties. He was also able to identify Robert Denny's DNA as matching the blood from the inside lip of the kitchen sink, which put him in the apartment. So we were jumping for joy at that point. He would have committed that crime. Detectives proceed with arresting Robert Denny. I am Detective Sergeant Billy Carlisle from the Jacksonville Beach, Florida Police Department. Are you, are you able? He's, he's just sick, that's... Okay, sure. Sorry. 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 That's okay. He was hyperventilating. And when we told him he was under arrest, he says, uh, for what? And we said, for a murder in Jacksonville Beach. I'd like to give you this opportunity. Uh, his face went white and all the blood ran out of his face. He denied killing Corey. And I am looking you in the eyes and I am telling you, swear to God, I didn't do it. Robert, you don't want to be man enough to... No, I am a man. I'm a hell of a man, and I'm honest, and I tell the truth, and I'm telling you the truth right now that I didn't do this. And he stuck to that. Investigators are now able to piece together the final 24 hours of Corey Parker's life. One o'clock, she was baking pies with her neighbor, Ashley, most of the afternoon until about six. At 10 p.m., she meets up with Tiffany at the Ritz bar, and they kind of hang out there till about 1.30 in the morning. Corey drives home. Police believe that Robert Denny was already in her apartment when she got home, that he had snuck in after she left, probably through that kitchen window. We believe that she was killed and nosed out herself inside her apartment. woman's worst nightmare. And you're inside your own apartment, locked inside, feeling safe. You go to crawl in your bed. And then out of the clear blue, someone jumps in bed with you and starts attacking you. It was apparent that she fought the suspect um, valiantly before she died. No doubt about it. Each one of those stabs is actually a surrogate sex act. Robert Denny is convicted of first degree murder on April 28, 2005. He is sentenced to life in prison. He's a sociopath. You know, he just doesn't care for life and doesn't matter to him that, that she's dead. And I don't think he regrets it to this date other than the fact that he's locked up, can't get out of prison. It's probably the most significant case of my career, uh, 43 years in law enforcement so far and still going. You know, it was a lot of hard work and a lot of time and effort, but uh, the end result for the family and for, you know, the... Right. Since then, my daughter's a beautiful young lady that's doing exactly what Corey does. She's going to school, she's holding down jobs, she has her own apartment. It hit me as a father that could have been my daughter. We got our guy off the street that could have been involved in many more homicides. My favorite memory of Corey is, is probably her smile. To keep her memory alive is to talk about her, to talk about her story, to talk about the way that she lit up a room. And I won't stop talking about her. And the amount of people that she um, affected in a positive way, um, it, that story won't die.